If you're like me and you go outside in a new place, you look around and you say, what is that? How did that happen? What that is, is earth surface processes and landscape development. Weathering produces all the soils, clays, sediment, and dissolved substances that we observe on the Earth's surface. Erosion is the removal of sediment by natural processes such as wind and rivers. Mass wasting is the downslope movement of masses of Earth material. It implies a large amount of material moving quickly. When we discuss landscapes, we're really discussing geomorphology. It's the study of landscapes and their evolution how landscapes form, and how they change over time. Landscapes are the result of a fierce competition between forces that raise the land surface, uplift the land, and those that weather the land, wear it down. Landscapes represent a balance between tectonic and climatic systems. What goes up must come down. What goes up fast comes down faster. So in this lecture, we'll talk about a number of different aspects of landscape development, including controls on weathering, chemical weathering, physical weathering, soils, the result of this weathering, erosion and the formation of stream valleys, how weathered material is moved away, mass wasting, rapid movement of large amounts of material in an event that's usually forced by gravity, classification of mass movements, we can define them based on what the cause is and what the result is, and then finally, to wrap things up, we'll talk about geomorphology and landscape development. Weathering is one of the major processes of the rock cycle. It forms the topography of the earth, altering rock materials and converting rocks into sediment and soil. Weathering is defined as the general process by which rocks are broken down at the earth's surface. Weathering is going to be forced or driven by climate. We can divide this up into two categories, chemical weathering and physical weathering. Chemical weathering is such that minerals are chemically altered or dissolve. They're going to change into another chemistry, or they're just going to become ions in a solution. Physical weathering, on the other hand, is when solid rock is fragmented by mechanical processes that do not change its chemical composition. It's the equivalent of breaking a rock with a sledgehammer, as opposed to cooking it or dissolving it in a vat of chemicals. Thus, chemical and physical weathering work together to change a rock from its original state to its weathered state. Erosion is the process by which particles produced by weathering are dislodged and removed from their source. We're going to break rock down, and then we need to move it. We need to get that material out of the way. That's done by erosion. Mass wasting is a kind of erosion Mass wasting includes all processes that move weathered and unweathered material downslope in larger amounts and single events than simple erosion. This is usually accomplished largely by gravity. What controls weather? What controls the rate at which a rock changes? Firstly, it's the properties of the parent rock. Various minerals weather at different rates depending on their solubility, their hardness, their size. A rock structure affects its susceptibility to cracking and fragmentation. Is the rock prone to development of joint sets, for instance? Is it prone to cracking and fragmenting because of tectonic forces? Controls on the weathering include climate, rainfall and temperature principally. The amount of rainfall determines the amount of reactive fluid that the rock is exposed to. The temperature is a little bit more simple. A 10 degree centigrade increase in temperature results in a doubling of the reaction rate. So for every few degrees the temperature increases, rocks dissolve more quickly. Soil, the presence or absence of this, it's a very reactive, living, breathing layer of stuff that's sitting on top of rocks. That layer of living, breathing, chemically reactive stuff that's sitting on the rocks is going to speed up the reaction of those rocks with that overlying material. So the presence of soil increases the weathering rate of rocks rather than decreases it, at least in terms of chemical weathering. The time that rocks are exposed also is important. If you have unlimited time, a very slow reaction rate, you'll come to a conclusion. If you have a very fast reaction rate and a limited amount of time, you'll come to the same conclusion, just more quickly. That conclusion would be the weathering, complete removal of pre-existing rocks and minerals. So taking a look at these with some real life examples, in terms of weathering rates, we go from slow 
to fast, a slow weathering rate would be quartz. A large piece of quartz would be known as a massive piece of quartz. Moving into a moderate weathering rate, we have minerals such as pyroxenes and feldspars. These form at higher temperatures generally than quartz. That means they're less stable at the low temperatures that we see at the Earth's surface. If there are zones of weakness within a rock, those provide conduits for fluids and for freezing water in the case of physical weathering. Something that's going to react fast would be the mineral calcite. It's relatively soluble. It's easily fractured. It can be thinly bedded in the case of a limestone. All these things lead to greater surface area exposure to reactive substances like water. In terms of climate, low rainfall means low weathering or very slow weathering rates. High rainfall can mean rapid weathering rates. Temperature, again, low temperatures mean low reaction rates, low or slow weathering. We crank the temperature up and we double the weathering rate for every 10 degrees. The presence or absence of soil and vegetation, if there's no soil, the rock is exposed directly to the atmosphere, but there's limited exposure to reactive fluids. Any rain that falls in the rock is going to wash away. It's only going to be in contact with those minerals in that rock for a brief period of time. A thick layer of soil covers that rock throughout the year. It keeps it wet, keeps it exposed to humic acids, other soil acids that are going to tend to break it down. And this is in part due to the organic content. Low organic content means a low degree of acidification. High degree of organic matter can produce a large amount of organic acids that are again going to be very reactive with any rock or mineral. Length of exposure seems pretty obvious. If you're exposed to weathering for a brief period of time, there's not going to be much weathering. Exposure to weathering for a long time implies lots of weathering. When minerals react with water and air, a couple different things can happen. Water can serve as a chemical cleaver. It can break things apart. This is by the process of hydrolysis, literally splitting by water. So water is going to react with minerals and break down. It's going to dissolve into that solution. Carbon dioxide also works with water. It's going to form carbonic acid, H2CO3. This carbonic acid is very reactive. It's very common and it provides us with acid rain. That acid rain in a non-buffered environment like the crystalline bedrock in upstate New York in the Adirondacks where it was largely discovered, that pH, the pH of that water is going to be controlled by the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In the Finger Lakes region of New York, which is buffered by carbonate and rock, the carbon dioxide doesn't change the pH of the lake water. Again, moist soils, lots of surface area, lots of acids, lots of water present. These are very reactive environments. Let's take a look at the reaction of a rock with its environment. So we'll start out with a granite, a typically coarse-grained igneous intrusive rock. It's going to be made up largely of feldspars and quartz and a couple other minerals of note here. So we have feldspar grain here, biotite grain here, some magnetite here, and then quartz, lots of quartz. Quartz is going to tend to be unreactive, and you'll notice that it remains as quartz crystals after the weathering process has completed. Other minerals, however, begin to break down. So splits or cracks are going to form along crystal boundaries, the boundary between different minerals. Feldspars, biotite, and magnetite start to decay. Magnetite is going to be oxidized. It's Fe3O4. It's going to be turned into rust, ultimately, Fe2O3. The biotite and the feldspars are going to be converted into clays. Again, the clays are very common geologically. We've removed much of the magnesium and the iron, and what we're left behind with is a potassium-rich aluminosilicate, known as a clay. And it's going to be a different type of clay depending on the starter mineral. The magnetite grains are just going to get smaller and smaller until, poof, they're gone. Now, surface area plays a role as well. Here we have a cube of granite, a 2 by 2 centimeter cube that has a surface area of 24 square centimeters. If we break this up into eight blocks, eight cubes, we've doubled the surface area to 48 centimeters squared. So large rocks, relative to their mass, have less surface area for chemical weathering, less exposure to fluids. Small rocks have a significantly greater surface area to volume ratio, therefore they're going to weather more quickly. In an extreme case, this is an aerogel, and it's made of silica, so it's not actually gel-like, it's, it's rigid. 
and this weighs about five grams or so. This has a surface area about the same size as a football field. So very, very large surface area per volume ratio. That makes it very useful. This stuff is fireproof, it's waterproof, it can be made waterproof, and it provides excellent insulation capabilities. So there's talk of making jackets out of it, making blankets, home insulation, all kinds of stuff. Cool, it's called an aerogel. Chemical weathering in the natural world is driven largely by carbon dioxide. So the weathering of silicates, such as feldspar, is going to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So the CO2 is drawn down as rocks weather. What this means is, as mountains pop up, the amount of CO2 required to weather those mountains increases, and that's going to draw CO2 down out of the atmosphere. So when we make big mountain ranges in geologic time, we draw down CO2. So this carbonic acid that's formed when CO2 mixes with water vapor is going to be reactive, and it's going to break down a feldspar, as I mentioned a minute ago. It's going to tend to remove the magnesium and iron and leave behind the potassium and aluminum. The net result is ultimately the bicarbonate ions are going to react with the feldspar weathering it to kaolinite. This is a very common clay. We put it in our coffee whitener, we put it in ice cream, candy bars, it's everywhere. And it's because it doesn't have a flavor, it's not poisonous, and uh, it weighs something. The net result is we're going to have a residual kaolinite deposit. We're going to convert a large granitic body of rock into clay and quartz sand grains. And we can see that summarized here. We're going to start out with some rocks exposed at the Earth's surface. The weathering of those rocks is going to lower CO2 in the atmosphere. It's going to reduce that. This lower CO2 results in a cooling of the climate. The lower temperatures and decrease in CO2 slow weathering down. So this reduced weathering rate is going to lead to an increase in atmospheric CO2. We're not pulling it out of the atmosphere as quickly now. This is going to lead to climate warming, which increases weathering. Increasing weathering reduces CO2 in the atmosphere, and this reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere leads to cooling, and around we go. Which brings us to mineral stability. Chemical stability is kind of a, a speed control or a brake for weathering. The more soluble you are, the faster your rate of dissolution, the faster the rate of dissolution, the faster the weathering. And when we look at the stability of common rock forming minerals, we see a range from very stable. The iron's already oxidized to hematite, so can't really add more oxygen to it. Aluminum hydroxides, very, very resistant to further weathering. Quartz, as you can imagine by now, very resistant to weathering. Clay minerals are the end product of weathering, so why would they weather more? Muscovite, orthoclase, biotite are also resistant, but not as resistant as these residual products. Uh, moving down the list towards least stable, we have minerals that form at higher and higher temperatures. Amphiboles, pyroxenes, calcium-rich plagioclase. This is the uh, anorthite or anorthosite. Then olivine, of course, very high temperature. Basaltic magmas, 1200 degree mineral, very unstable at Earth's surface temperatures. Halite and calcite, both highly soluble and easy to break up, so they're going to weather very quickly. Other reactive gases that are important in weathering include oxygen. From iron silicates to iron oxides, we're going to add oxygen to a mineral and create a new mineral. So we can go from anoxic to oxic iron. Now let's take a look at another gas that's very important in weathering, oxygen. Here we're going to take a look at the transition from an iron silicate to an iron oxide. This is a very common process and it's fairly striking visually, photographically, and in a lot of different ways. In this process, we're going to convert ferric iron to ferrous iron. We're going to go from iron in an anoxic environment to iron in an oxygenated environment. And we're going to start out with a common iron silicate. We're going to create hematite, a common iron oxide. And then we're going to talk about the implications for that hematite in the sedimentary rock record. So here we have the process, starting with an iron silicate, pyroxene, Fe, SiO3, we're going to add some water in an anoxic environment. That water is going to remove some of this iron, Fe2+, it's going to free it up to combine with any oxygen that's available and convert it to ferric iron, iron 3+. 
this ferric iron in turn is going to combine with water and precipitate as a solid iron oxide, hematite, Fe2O3. The same chemical formula as common rust. The result is take just a little bit of that hematite, about 2 to 3 percent hematite in a sandstone, and you get the bright red Navajo sandstone of Monument Valley in southern Utah.